Welcome to Compelling Strategies for Passing the AutoCAD 2015 Certified Professional Exam. My name is JC Malitsky and I'm President Owner of Digital JC CAD. This video is based on a course that I will be teaching this year at Autodesk University. I'm a former community college professor and a former department chair was an ATC manager and I'm currently an ATC instructor. I've been using and teaching AutoCAD since 1985 and I'm co-author on several AutoCAD textbooks. I'm an Autodesk certified instructor for both AutoCAD and Autodesk Inventor and I'm an Autodesk certification evaluator. This year will be my 20th year presenting at Autodesk University and I've passed all the AutoCAD exams that I've taken. I just don't remember how many. Let's take a look at the class summary. We want to develop those workflow strategies for how you can pass the AutoCAD exam and also develop a strategy for what to study and what not to study. But your goal is to pass the AutoCAD 2015 Certified Professional Exam. So at the end of this class, you'll be able to develop navigation workflow strategies for passing the exam, develop some time-saving study and preparation techniques based on the roadmap exam objectives, and develop a strategy for working through each question, and prepare a strategy for what to study and what not to study. This presentation is for educational purposes only. No AutoCAD professional certification exams questions were used or discussed during this video. This presentation is designed to highlight compelling tips and techniques for methods of study and preparation. There are no guarantees that by reviewing this video, you will pass any of the AutoCAD certification exams. But I hope you do. So when we're looking at getting Autodesk certified, we have three different certifications that may be right for you. The user certification, the professional, or the specialist. You need to go to the Autodesk certification website and download the exam roadmaps that outline the objectives for each of those exams. Also, Make sure, of course, you have the Autodesk software and it's free download for all students. And you need to get training, whether you get training at a reseller, at an ATC, a college, but do get some formal training. And practice what you've learned. Download the objectives and study those objectives and practice those objectives so you can pass the exam. Pick one of the three exams, the user, professional, or specialist, or all three. I went to the Autodesk website at autodesk.com forward slash certification, and I pulled these screen grabs right from their website. You need to go to Certiport, and Certiport is a company that delivers the user exam. We're going to be discussing the Autodesk professional exam, which is provided at a certification center, and also the Autodesk certified specialist exam, which is provided at a certification center. So user exam at Certiport, certified professional and certified specialist. So let's get started. Let us begin with seven compelling strategies. The first is navigating the exam. We will investigate tips and techniques for navigating through the exam in a more efficient method. We'll also look at the key, what I call the key to studying for the exam, and those are the roadmap objectives. We're going to look at setting your tools in AutoCAD. What tools do we need in AutoCAD to set? 
to make our workflow very smooth. And also, what do we need to practice? Basically, practice does not make perfect, but perfect practice makes perfect. So we go back to those objectives, study those, and practice those. We'll look at review, and we'll look at the inquiry commands, the list, the distance, area, angle, the subcommand options of the measure geom command. We'll also take a look at what if you don't pass the exam? What are some of the techniques that you need to study and to re-prepare to pass the exam? Of the seven compelling strategies, let's take a look at number one, navigating the exam. And I call your attention to the lower left of the screen for the job entry level skills. If you're at that level, look at the CertiPort Certified User Exam. If you're at the intermediate professional level, we can look at the 2014 exam, or of course what we're going to talk about today, the 2015 professional exam. But the key, no matter what exam you look at, is to review those roadmap objectives. The AutoCAD professional exam is very similar. Notice I have 2013, 2014, and 2015. If you've taken the exams over the last few years, you can see some consistency, a similarity between the objectives and how the exams are structured. That's a huge advantage for those of you who have taken the exam before. But we need to look at the types of questions that we need to navigate through. For example, of the 35 questions on the professional exam, there's a group of questions that are skill-based, hands-on, where you open AutoCAD and follow steps, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe, to complete the task of what the question asks. We also need to look at the knowledge-based questions, and those are the multiple choice, the drag and drops. So you'll have some answers on one side and the questions on the right, and you drag and drop them across the screen. And of course, point and click, to something that is on the screen. So again, it's a typical knowledge-based question that you're used to in most other types of exams. But a key strategy you really need to look at is to read all the question. Just don't read part of the question and read the question slowly. I cannot tell you how many times people have come up to me after the exam complaining how they missed the question. And after we discussed the question with them, we realized they didn't read the whole question. They only read part of it. And you want to look at each question to identify key words that make sense to you of how to answer that question. But you want to read all the possible answers before you make your determination on that correct answer. So after you've read the question, you want to read all of the possible answers. You want to look for some absolutes, words in the question, like all or none or always or never, and they're usually false type of questions. Often, seldom, may, generally, those are usually true. But I want to give Autodesk a lot of credit here. The exam questions are written quite well. I mentioned how you need to do maybe those three, four, five, six, seven tasks in a hands-on question. And for the most part, that's what we've been telling everybody over the years. Make sure that you follow the task in exact order. However, in some cases, those of you who have great AutoCAD skills, you may read the whole question and realize, I can do this steps of procedures not in maybe seven, I could do it in two or three. If you want to take that chance, go ahead because you can always save some time. But remember, you can always go back and review. And look for common errors as distractors in a question. So for a multiple choice question, you may have four possible answers. If you don't know the answer, go ahead and eliminate one immediately. And usually one of the answers to the questions jumps right off the page at you and you realize that that can't be one of the answers. And then you have three left. Take another one out, and you're left with two. So you have one of, 
of two possible answers that you can use. So again, if you don't know, really know the answer to the question, take out what you don't know. And then, of course, look for positive and negative phrasing in a question. And the reason why this is important to me is this is how I miss questions. For example, when the question says, what is the valid answer? What is the true answer versus invalid or false? Sometimes I read it wrong and I look, oh, it's a valid and they really want the invalid or the false answer. And then I get it wrong because I didn't, A, read the phrasing of the question and I didn't read all the possible answers. If you do that, you eliminate simple errors. And I can tell you from fact, this is again, how I miss some of my answers on these exams. For the hands-on questions, look at the stem of the question. See what you need to do. Realize and analyze what tools do you need to solve that question. Then for the multiple choice questions, read all the information. But before you look at the answer, answers, if you know the answer, you should think of it in your mind and have that ready to go. So read a multiple choice question. Don't look at the answers. Answer it in your mind. Look at the four possibles. Take out distractors. And that's a good strategy of how to work that question. For the hands-on questions, you're going to need to use Alt-Tab to jump between AutoCAD and the online exam. You're also going to need to use Control C, Control V, or right mouse button copy, right mouse button paste to take the answers off of the command line or maybe the properties palette and take those answers and put those in the answer box in the exam. So what you need to do is not type in the answer. Again, I can't tell you how many people going to type the answer in the box instead of doing a control C, control V, or right mouse button copy, right mouse button paste, and they type in the answer wrong. At the same time, I know people that have done control C, gone over to the exam, did a control V to paste the answer in, went to the next question, did a control C, go into the exam, control V, and they pasted in the answer from the previous question because they didn't spend time checking that answer. So be very careful when you're transferring from AutoCAD into the exam. If you know the answer, answer it. That's a simple statement, right? But the reality is, as many times people will vacillate on how to answer the question or think too much into the question. If you read the question, you know the answer, answer it. And... But if you don't know the answers, just skip it. Don't spend minutes going over an answer that you possibly can't get because you just don't know the question. Skip it and come back to it later. But also, if you're unsure, you might know it, you may not, put the answer in there and mark it. So the strategy is, if you know it, answer it, move on. If you don't know it, don't spend a lot of time, skip it and move on. And if you're not quite sure, mark it. Because remember, in every good online exam, you can come back and review the answers that you've skipped or marked. With that in mind, we have that two-hour time limit for the exam. So at the end of the exam, review all the questions if you have time. I do not like to go back to questions that I've already answered. If I know that they're correct for sure, I don't go back. Sometimes I do, but for the most part, I don't. Because we know that if you have a correct answer and you go back and you change it, most likely you change it to the wrong answer. Go back to the ones you marked that you weren't sure about and go back to the ones that are incomplete or the ones that you just skipped. And the reason why I mention that is I cannot tell you how many times people have come up to me at the end of the exam and they did not finish the exam and they say, I missed the exam. I didn't pass by one or two questions. Then I say, did you, did you answer all those questions? And they say, no, I didn't get to the last one or two. Well, you should always go through all the questions and then go back. A key strategy. And that's the strategy. Answer all the questions. And leave time at the end to reread both the questions and the answers 
that you've marked and you've skipped. And when you're done, press end. So how does one get ahead and take advantage of what Autodesk provides to you so you can pass the professional exam? The answer is the roadmap objectives. There are a few easy steps to get started. Download the roadmap objectives PDF file from the Autodesk website. And we will cover some of these objectives later in this video. Review those objectives to get a better understanding of what to study and what not to study. And this is your strategic roadmap. But ask yourself before you start your review, do you really know everything about all the commands referenced in the exam objectives? Well, the answer probably is no. So look at the Autodesk official certification guides from Wiley Cybex or Ascent. Or look online for YouTube videos or from videos from vendors that produce AutoCAD training videos. Again, only search for videos online that relate to the exam's objectives. Look at textbooks. Look at training manuals. But what to study and what not to study? Well, we already know the answer. Just look at those objectives. But where could you start? I think a great place to start is to go into AutoCAD Help. So for example, if the objective has you look at Layer Properties Manager, open up Help and go to the Layers Property Manager and look at what every topical area is listed in help. Do you know what layer lock means and what it does? What about layer transparency? I think you get the idea. We need to look at all of those features of the layer properties manager. But the help menu is a great place to find out what the command is all about and about each subcommand or command options. Work on studying the little known, hardly used subcommands or those command oddities. And remember the old saying that we use 20% of the commands 80% of the time? Well, you need to know more than 20%. When would, we, when would we use break or blend or join objects? Again, we talked about layers. Do you know everything about layers and how to manipulate them? And when you do manipulate them, what happens? Or what about the different types of grips? There's two types, multi-function grips and grip modes, such as stretch, move, rotate, scale, and mirror. And when do you do a fillet? Is a different filling, filleting a couple lines versus a polyline? And we could go on about creating and editing polylines. But I think you get the idea of what I'm trying to tell you. Study everything about the command, the subcommands, the command oddities, etc., etc., etc. And repeat for every single command that is referenced in those road map objectives. Before you start the exam, Launch AutoCAD and set your tools. There are two tool settings that you need to set. The first is to turn on polar tracking and set your increment angle to 90 degrees. You can also launch the drafting settings dialog box to set the increment angle and to turn polar tracking on. The second tool that you need to set is running object snap. So turn on your running object snaps and set endpoint, midpoint, center, intersection, extension, and possibly insertion point, those six. If you're uncomfortable turning on all six, do not turn on insertion. Again, you could go to the drafting settings dialog box and turn on object snap tracking 
with those six running object snaps. If you have the six running object snaps on, remember you can use the tab key to cycle through the different object snap modes when you're in a drawing. It's practice time, so you want to make sure before you sit for the exam that you practice each AutoCAD command referenced in the exam objectives. As time permits, Let's review some of the exam objectives using the appropriate AutoCAD command. Let's take a look at the following commands and features. We will start with rotate and talk about the different methods to create selection sets. We'll look at polar, rectangular, and path arrays and talk about hatch island detection. We'll look at blocks how to create different workflows for fillets, the join and blend curve commands, as well as trim and extend. We'll talk a little bit about layers and text and dimension styles. And we'll conclude with the inquiry commands. In our first rotate example, an engineering change order requires us to drill another hole at 128 degrees on that center line. So I can use rotate copy with a reference angle since I do not know what angle that hole is currently set at. Now you're looking at the part and you're probably saying, isn't it easier just to go in and copy that circle? Well, of course it is. So I'm going to go into copy and I'm going to copy that circle from its center point over to the intersection of the center lines. And there it is. But what if you get this? What if your change order comes in and you have no center lines? You don't know where the object is to be placed, but you know that you need to rotate and copy it at 128 degrees. So I'm going to use rotate and select that circle. It prompts me for the base point and the base point is going to be the center point of the hub projection, not the red center lines. I'm going to go in and select the word copy and then select the word reference. And AutoCAD prompts me for the reference angle. I'm going to select the center of the hub projection again, and the center of the circle, not the red center line. AutoCAD prompts me for the new angle, and the new angle is 128. And there's a good example of using rotate with a copy and a referenced angle. In our second rotate example, the two chairs are rotated at angles that are not parallel to the desk or to the computer. So I'm going to go in and select one of the chairs and then select a grip to rotate off of. So now I have a hot grip and if I use my space bar and cycle through the grip modes from stretch to move to rotate, I could arbitrarily rotate this and, and eyeball it till it looks fairly parallel to that desk. That's really not what I want to do. I'm going to use the rotate command and I'm going to use the rotate command to select that chair and select the base point as the center of that circle. I need to go down and select the word reference and then specify a reference angle. But I don't know what the reference angle is, so I'm going to select the edge of the chair. When it prompts me to pick a new angle, I don't know what that angle is, but I can go in and select points and select the two points that will make the front of the chair parallel to the desk. I can also go into rotate and select the chair on the top. 
When it prompts me for the base point, I'm going to select that center again and come down and select the word reference. I'm going to reference the endpoints of the chair and now select the word points. The two points in this case are the two points along the face of the computer and that rotates the chair parallel to the computer. So in this case, we have two good examples of using reference as rotation angles and points to make that reference angle parallel to the desk or to the computer. In this scenario, we have lot 232, map 138, that needs to be modified. We need to erase the geometry in that lot to make some changes. I can use different selection sets to erase the geometry. So I'm going to go into Erase and go to the lower right to the upper left and create a crossing. And a crossing is identified by the dashed lines, not by the green inside those dashed lines. Well, anything that the crossing touches or is inside gets selected. And when I press Enter, well, it takes away way too much information. The opposite of crossing is window. So I'm going to go into Erase. And in the upper left-hand corner, I'm going to select, and I'm going to come down to the lower right. When I select that, I create a window. And I realize I didn't select everything in that window. So I'm going to do a second window. I realize that I have a little bit more than I needed to erase. So I can hold the Shift key down and remove geometry from my selection set. And now when I press Enter, the geometry that I need to erase is erased. So window would be very appropriate. Well, we have some other selection sets that we could use. I'm going to erase by a CP enter, a crossing polygon. And I can just pick carefully around what I want to select. And hopefully I don't pick stuff that uh, the crossing just is not working for this. It's just too much information is being selected because of the way crossing works. Well, I'm going to go into Erase and do a WP, Window Polygon. And if I do a Window Polygon, it's more surgical. I can be very careful where I select as long as I have everything within that selection set. And if I have everything within that selection set, a Window Polygon is more appropriate. If I forget something or the window just doesn't select that object as whole, I can come back and use my pick box to select it and then press enter. So in this case, a window polygon may actually be better than a window. So those, those are four different methods, crossing, crossing polygon, window, window polygon. But new to AutoCAD 2015 is lasso. So I'm gonna go in and erase, and I'm just going to select and if I go to the left and follow along, I'm holding my cursor down. I'm putting the lasso over what I want to select. And when I press Enter, there is my selection set. Again, I have way too much geometry in my selection set. So the crossing definitely is not what I want to use. But if I erase and I select and I go the other way, you can see that I'm creating a window lasso. I'm holding my left mouse button down as I draw the lasso over the geometry that I want and I press enter. Again, if I select too much, hold my shift key down and select the geometry and now press enter and my geometry is erased. So of the six methods that I showed you, the best one in this case would be erase by a window lasso. In our first array scenario, we need to array the desk, the two chairs, and the computer into the next two offices. I'm going to select Array and select Rectangular Array. 
and using a crossing, select the four objects and press enter. In the columns panel, I know I need three columns. And in the rows panel, I need one row. And as I look at my array, I notice that the spacing is off. It, it just isn't right. So I could go back to my spacing between the columns and reset that value. But quite frankly, I don't know what that value is. If I go down to the command line area at the bottom of the screen and select the word spacing, I can zoom in and select the inside of one wall to the corresponding inside of the next wall. And my three objects in the array will be spaced equally. This is a great example of using spacing when you do not know the spacing between the columns. In our second scenario, I need to create an array of 180 degrees clockwise, creating four instances of that chair. So I'm going to go in and select Polar Array and select the chair. AutoCAD will prompt me for the center of the array, which happens to be the insertion point of the center of this block. I'm going to change the number of items in the items panel to 4, and I'm going to change the fill angle to 180 degrees, not minus 180. But what I can do is change the direction of the array by selecting direction in the properties panel. And I'm going to press enter, and there's my array. If I'm requested to find the distance from the center of one chair to the center of the second chair, I can go into Measure and select Distance. But you know, quite frankly, that takes too long a time for me to do that, to keep coming back up to the menu to be able to do that under the Utilities panel. I usually just type in DI for Dist, and then I can select the center of one chair to the center of the next chair, and get that distance. Or maybe I need to know the center of one chair to the center of the next chair. In either case, by typing in DI, which will give you the distance from one point to the second. In our third scenario, I need to array that chair around the table or about the table. I'm going to select my path array and select the chair and press enter. I'm going to select the table as my path that I want the chair to array about, but I need to change from measure to divide in that properties panel. Now, how many items do I need about the chair? I need 10 items divided equally about that chair. And there I have it. So I use the table as my path to align those chairs properly with a path array. Wow, what is this? Somebody sent me a drawing that has a hatch pattern that just ignores everything and they don't know how to fix it. Well, one of the things that we can do is select the hatch pattern and always look in the properties palette for the type of island detection that's being used. And I see that it says ignore. So in properties, I could change that to outer. And sure enough, it fixed it. I could also go in and select the hatch patterns, come up here to options, and change the island detection to whatever island detection I want. So two ways to change island detection. Options or in Properties. In this drawing, I've noticed that the chair blocks and the computer block are really dated. We have new chairs that we're going to be putting in our office 
and a new computer. So we need to insert the blocks, but they're not in the drawing, in the drawings block reference table. They're on our server. So I'm going to go into insert and insert a block. And I do want to call your attention to the gallery that is shown in AutoCAD 2015. But these blocks are not the blocks I want. So I'm going to go to more options and I'm going to browse over to my server. And I know I need to insert a new chair. This chair has a square front and a more square back than the rounded front and the rounded back that's currently in this drawing. So I'm going to go ahead and open this chair block and click OK. Do I want to redefine the block that's currently in the block reference table of this drawing? The answer is yes. So I'm going to redefine the block. And I'm going to place this block in the drawing. And as you can tell, the rounded front chairs have now changed to the square front chairs. It's not on the right layer. I'm not on the right layer when I inserted this furniture. So I need to select that block and change that to the furniture chair layer. And now all my blocks have been updated in this drawing to the new block definition. So I need to go into insert again, go to more options, and I'm going to browse to find the new computer. So the new computer is more flat screen with a new keyboard, wireless keyboard. So I'm going to click open and I'm going to go ahead and click OK and redefine the block that's currently in this drawing. And there is the new block definition. So I've gone in and created two new block definitions by going to my server and redefining the existing blocks in my drawing. The next thing that I noticed that the blocks in this current drawing of the chair are not correct. So I'm going to edit this block in the block editor. So I'm going to select the block and I'm just going to type in BE for the block editor. That's my workflow. It saves me time. And there's the chair block that I'm going to click OK. When I go into the block editor, notice that you have the authoring palette. And I'm going to redefine the base point of the chair to be right at that center. I'm not sure where that is. And also, I know I need to draw a couple lines to represent some of the new fabric design that goes on our chair. And that's how the chair looks. So it's able to add a new base point and to change the way the shape of the chair looks. I'm going to go ahead and close the block editor and save the changes to the chair. And now you can see my modifications and changes have been applied to this current drawing only. In this example, we have four objects that we need to apply fillets to. We need to apply these fillets efficiently. Some of the objects are lines, and one object is a polyline. So I'm going to go into the fillet command, go to the bottom of the screen in the command line area, and set my radius to 0.5. I'm going to select this horizontal line, then the vertical line, to apply that half-inch fillet. And I noticed that something, it didn't, it didn't trim that back. I'm going to undo that. And let's see what happens again when I try it the second time. When I go into fillet, and set my radius to 0.5, I notice a subcommand or command option called trim. Oh, I see. Whoever used this last time has it set to no trim. So I'm going to set it to trim and now select the horizontal line and select the vertical line. And now you can see that the fillet has been trimmed. I hit the space bar, do the vertical line, the horizontal line, do the space bar. Do the horizontal line, do the vertical line, hit the space bar. Do the vertical line, do the horizontal line. And notice as I selected the lines, I was able to create those four fillets. However, that's not too efficient, is it? So I'm going to undo back. I'm going to go into fillet again, 
set my radius to 0.5. I better check trim to see that. Nope, it sets a no trim. I'm going to select the word trim. And now I'm going to select the word multiple. And now pick the horizontal and the vertical. And I'm not selecting the space bar. I'm just selecting the objects as I walk myself around the part. Way more efficient to use multiple. The next object is a polyline. I'm going to go into fillet. My radius is already set to 0.5. So I'm going to select the polyline option and select the polyline. That's way more efficient than picking, picking, picking all the horizontal or vertical lines. In this case, I need to close this off as a triangle. So I'm going to go into fillet. I'm going to set my radius to zero. And then I'm going to select the two lines so they intersect and create a zero radius fillet. And last is this object. I need to put a cap on here. So in other words, I need to fillet this. But can I do that using the fillet command? Well, let's see. So I'm going to go into fillet. I'll select the first line. I'll select the second line. And yes, we can fillet parallel lines. In the next example, we're going to look at trim and extend. And on this object here, I need to trim off all the lines that are outside of that circle. So, so I'm going to go into Trim, and AutoCAD prompts me to select my cutting edges. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to press Enter to select all the objects. And again, in the command line area, I'm going to select the word Fence. And I'm going to create a Fence Selection Set across my objects, and you can see in AutoCAD 2015 how the objects are highlighted. I'm going to press Enter, and there's my objects trimmed off. Same goes for these lines. If I need to trim back the yellow lines to the cyan line, I go into Trim, I press Enter. I go to Fence, and I just draw a fence across what I want to take away, and I press Enter. While I'm still in the Trim command, if I hold my Shift key down, I can extend the lines to other objects where they intersect. So as you can see, I can hold the Shift key down as I extend those objects. So Trim and Extend with the Shift key giving the ability to flip between Trim and Extend. Now we need to join objects, or we need to blend objects. So let's start with a very simple one first. We have two collinear lines. Can we join those two lines together by using the join command? You can type in J for join, and then select the word join. Select the first object, select the second object, press Enter, and now you have joined those two lines together to form one line. We have these two lines. Can I join these two lines together? Let's try it. I'm going to go to Join, select that line, select that line, and I cannot join those two lines because they're not collinear. The same thing for these two lines down here. I can't join those. What do we have over here? We have, looks like an arc and a polyline. Yes. Can we join an arc to a polyline? Let's try that one. I'm going to go J for join. I'm going to select the arc. I'm going to select the polyline and press enter. And yes, we can join an arc and a polyline. Are these polylines or splines? What do we have here? These are, looks like we have splines. There's one, two, three splines. Can we join these three splines together? Let's try that. J for join. I'm going to select this one to this one. Press Enter. Nope, discarded from the operation. You try Join again and press Enter. And yes, let's try these two splines. I'm going to go J for Join. 
select this object and select this object and press enter. Nope, two objects discarded from operation. So what if I come under fillet and use blend curves? And when I go to select blend curves, I will go in and select one object and then the other object to blend those two objects together with a blended curve. Now, can I join those three together now? I'm going to go in the join, join one to two to three, and press enter. And sure enough, I have one continuous spline by blending the curve. We have an architectural drawing with various details. And we need to review the layer scheme. So I'm going to go to the Layers Property Manager and take a look at the different layers. And I have an assignment for you. Do you understand what a locked layer is and what it does inside of AutoCAD? I think we know about freezing and turning on and off layers. But do you really know what a locked layer does? We need to study that. What about layer transparency? Do you understand what layer transparency does to a drawing? And how do you apply layer transparency? What about plot, no plot? I think that's pretty simple. We know if we don't want a layer to plot, we just select the icon, right? But what does new VP layer freeze mean? So in the case of looking at a drawing that is currently in model space, do you understand all the different options we have for different layers? Also, what about a layer name? Let's switch over to our sections and details. And I clicked on sections and details tab to go into our sheet and look at the difference of layers here. We still have layer locked that we talked about before in transparency and plot and no plot. But we also have new VP layer freeze and VP layer freeze. What, do, what does viewport layer freeze mean versus freeze? Right? What about VP color? How is VP color different than color? VP line type, line weight, VP transparency. So your assignment is to go back and look at the layers property manager of how layers are designed in model space and how we use them. And also, what are our options on our sheet and, and our layout? As we're looking at our details, I wonder how the dimensions and text were applied to this drawing. Do they have the annotative property on them or not? So I'm going to give them a test. I'm going to go down and select at the bottom of the screen to change my annotation scale in model space. And I know my scale is currently set at a half of an inch to a foot. I'm going to change it to a quarter inch to a foot and let's see what happens to the drawing. So as I select the drawing, I notice that my text size, my dimensions are changing. So it looks like they have the annotative property set. Yes, they do. There's a sixteenth of an inch to a foot. I'll go to three-eighths of an inch to a foot. Three-eighths to an inch. Where did all my dimensions go? Wow. So I'm going to look at <laughs> I'm going to look down in the bottom of the screen where it says Show Annotative Objects. Go ahead and click that on, and that will show all the annotation objects that we have. And then add those annotation scales. So 3 eighths of an inch wasn't added to our list. So I'm going to click that on. So these two buttons at the bottom of the screen, what I call our easy buttons, need to be set. So now I'm going to go back and set to a half of an inch to a foot. And you can see how my annotation scale changes in model space. Let's select the Sections and Details tab. And I'm going to zoom in on this detail area. And let's see how it works here. So I'm going to go in and select and change 
my different viewport scales. So if you noticed, I went in and I turned on my add annotative scales and show annotation scales. And I'm going to go ahead and change the scale of that viewport. So I'm clicking on this viewport to change it, the scale, and I can't do that. Well, in AutoCAD 2015, as well as in other versions of AutoCAD, we have our lock. So we need to unlock that viewport before we can go in and make those changes. So you can see as I jockey my scale up and down, the size of the dimensions and the text will change. So I'm going to go back to that half of an inch equals a foot. And there's my detail and how everything adjusts. So your assignment here is investigate annotative objects inside of AutoCAD. But also, I need to take a look at the dimension style and the text style. So I'm going to go ahead and select the annotative tab. And under the text panel in the right corner is that arrow that's at an angle. That's your dialog box launcher. So I'm going to select the dialog box launcher. And I notice all the different text styles that are currently in my drawing. I believe Romans is the text style that has been used. And I do call your attention to the paper text height is set to an eighth of an inch. So your assignment is, do you understand about setting the annotative property when creating text styles? Besides the text styles, I want to look at dimension styles. So I'm going to go ahead and select the dialog box launcher. And notice we have two annotative text styles and standard text style. So I'm going to go into modify and take a look at the architectural text style. And I know that we're using architectural units and our fit is annotative. So whoever set this drawing up, set up the property of annotative. And let's check our text style. Our text style is set to Romans. Your assignment is to review everything that's in lines, symbols and arrows, text, fit, primary units, alternate units, and tolerances. In other words, study your dimension style dialog box. After you have spent time practicing with AutoCAD 2015, go back to Help. Launch the Help menu and take a look at those commands and features that relate to the roadmap objectives. We have previously discussed looking at the certified prep materials as well as online videos and papers. If you have textbooks and training manuals, take a look at them and look at previous Autodesk University videos. For example, go to YouTube, look at Digital JC CAD, and I have previously recorded videos about AutoCAD certification. Also, look at the Autodesk University website. There are current certification overview videos, not only of AutoCAD, but of other Autodesk products. A must for this exam and for you to work efficiently through the exam is to know the measure GM command options such as distance and area and radius and angle. Also make sure you understand and how to use the properties palette as well as the list command. So let's take a few minutes and look at how to use these different commands and features inside of AutoCAD. In our final scenario, we need to inquire about how this part was created, the diameters of those circles, the radius of the arc, the angles of how this part was designed, the length of a line, and the surface area of that part. I could use the measure geom command 
and use distance, radius, angle, and area to find those answers. But also, I have other tools that I can use. I could type in DI for distance and select the distance from the center of the small circle to the center of the large circle. And now I know the spacing between those two circles, or from the small circle to the circle on the top. Again, typing in DI saved me a little time. How long is this line along the top? I would type in LI for list, select that line, and press Enter. And AutoCAD will give you the length of that line. So using the list command will give you the length. What about the diameter of the circles? Well, I could come up here to measure and select radius. Radius, yes, yeah, select the radius of that circle and not only will it give you the radius, but we really need the diameter of that circle. So even though it says radius under the measure geom command, we can go in and find the diameter and radius at the same time. I can go to radius and find the radius of this arc. But what about the angles that are created? What's this angle? right here. I need to know that angle. It's 131 degrees. What about another angle? What's the angle up here? It's 121 degrees. So it again helps me find the different angles. And I could find the area of the part, except we may have a problem. In the problem, this looks like just a bunch of lines that were drawn instead of a polyline. So I need to go in and create a polyline boundary to create one closed and bounded piece of geometry. So I'm going to go to the Modify panel, P Edit for Polyline Edit, and I'm going to select that top line and press Enter to turn it into a polyline. I'm going to go into Join, but when I go into Join, I have to select the remaining objects. Instead of picking and picking, I'm going to type in F for Fence and press enter and create a fence across my part, which is a cousin to a crossing. And how do we know that? We know that by the dashed lines that it is being created. When I press enter, now I have that piece of geometry as one polyline. Now I could find the area. And I'm going to show you two ways to find the area. I'm going to go into measure area and I call your attention to the command line area where I want to go add area object and select the polyline. Press enter, go to subtract area object and pick the four circles to subtract from the plate. And that's how you use the area command. However, there's a faster way. The faster way to find an area of this object is to hatch it. So I'm going to go into Hatch. I'm going to pick my object and press Enter. I'm going to select the hatch pattern. And if you look in the Properties palette under Area, you can see that we have 400, 34, 47, 87. It's exactly the same as using the area command. Now notice the hatch pattern I used. It doesn't make a difference which hatch pattern you use. So if you need to find an area of a flat 2D geometry very quickly, just hatch it. But what if you do not pass the exam? Get the results printed out immediately at the exam site. Super important so you know exactly what you need to study. But don't get down on yourself. Immediately start writing down all the possible things that you remember about the exam. For example, was it a knowledge-based question, a multiple choice, a drag and drop, a point and click on the screen? Or was it a hands-on skill-based type of question? That gives you direction of what to study. 
How was the questions worded? Draw pictures down of what you remember about all those questions in the exam. Go back to your computer and start to review immediately when you get home. And the key is that you do not want to lose any possible advantage that you've already had by taking the exam. And the key is right after the exam, you are the most dialed into the exam mentally. Review immediately after the exam. So in conclusion, I hope we've developed that navigation workflow strategy for passing the AutoCAD 2015 professional exam. I think we did. We have developed some time-saving preparation techniques based on those objectives because we only need to study those objectives and the commands and features that relate. We've also developed a strategy for working through each question, making sure you highlight only those topical areas and features that make sense to how the question is worded. And last, to prepare for what to study and not to study. And again, we keep going back to that roadmap objectives that is the key of what to study and what not to study. So I want to thank you for spending your valuable time with us today. And good luck on passing the AutoCAD 2015 Professional Certification Exam.